Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 says ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you so there's a there's a, a, a dimension of prayer that is asking there's a dimension of prayer that is seeking there's a dimension of prayer that is knocking there's a dimension of prayer that is praising there's a dimension of prayer that is giving there's a dimension of prayer that is fasting but that means you can ask your prayer you can seek your prayer you can knock your prayer you can praise your prayer you can fast your prayer you can give your prayer he said for everyone that asks it receiving is it true that all of your asking translated to receiving now if that's not true it means that there are some principles about asking that you have not known he said that is according to the chapter the provision that is in the justice system of heaven the provision the law is that everyone that asked it receive it he now takes us into a subject matter he said oh or what man is there of you whom if his son shall ask bread will give him a stone so he, he brings the concept of fatherhood after telling you the potential the provision that is available to us to motivate us to explore the dimensions of prayer he now in attempting to explain the possibilities that abound he now brings again the concept of father this is what he says he says what man is there of you whom his son shall ask bread will give him a stone or if he ask a fish will give him a serpent I think we can answer that question there's no man like that here are you there that means in our practice of fatherhood it has never ever happened that your son came to ask you for bread and you pulled out a serpent for him. In your model of fatherhood, it has never, never happened when your son comes to ask you for fish and you give him a stone. Still fatherhood. Then he now makes a statement, a humbling one. He says, if ye then being evil, stop there. Now, now, this, this uh, you are not with me. Stay with me, stay with me. I need to, you know, you're offended, but don't be, don't be. What Jesus is saying is that compared to God, you are evil. But your evil, your, your being evil doesn't stop you from giving good gifts to your children. Are you there? So, this is the comparison that Jesus makes with his own father's model of fatherhood and our own model of fatherhood he calls our model of fatherhood evil and that's why i'm telling you oh you're not here uh, let me let me finish my reading he said if then if ye then being evil compared to god in his model of fatherhood know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more in a greater dimension than any man can ever hope to be that's the context in which the fatherhood of god is superfluous with mercy and grace so your own model of fatherhood as powerful as it is it cannot be an example of god's fatherhood because it is so diminished in its calibration that it is regarded as evil so he says we are evil our fatherhood is evil so your fatherhood cannot be an example or an illustration of the kind of it falls short of that level of glory he said how much more will your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him so your heavenly father is capable of giving good things but his intention so to do will be exploited by prayer you will have to ask him So now that we know that our model of fatherhood falls short of the kind of father that God is, it means we do not know God's fatherhood. And that's why we need to do this teaching. There's only one way we can know God's fatherhood. 
and I need to show you. It's in the book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. The Bible says, and when thou prayest, the first thing I need to draw your attention to in this presentation is that Jesus did not say, if thou prayest. Jesus said, when thou prayest. A prayer is not supposed to be what we do. Prayer is supposed to be who we are. The Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 18 verse, verse 1 and he speak a parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Prayer is not what we do. Prayer is who we are. If you, if you are no longer praying, you, you, it means a part of your existence died. A part of it died. The way man was designed, the way man was created, he was created to get by through prayer. That is, as he prays, that's how he advances. As he prays, that's how God gives him the resources that is needed in measures of grace for him to prosecute life. When you stop praying, things die. You decide to live like a crippled person. When I saw the gravity of these matters, I myself didn't like prayer. But when I saw the gravity of the matters in my Bible study, <laughs> Uh, I studied more to find out the spiritual resources that God had put in place to ensure that weak people like us can participate. It is because of this that he deliberately decided to create us insufficient. How many of you still remember the terrible days of COVID? People would just breathe in and die. That's how vulnerable you are. You are not aware of it. People would drink water and die. They would eat food. They say, oh, food poisoning. There was no poison in that food. Then antibiotics everywhere. Antibiotics in the drip. Antibiotics intravenous that's how frail man is that's how frail you are you, i know you wear the cap of your phd you wear the cap of your master's degree and that looks like shelter to you but it's just covering <laughs> oh my god oh my god please help me preach to your neighbor i hope you are not on life support i hope <laughs> I, I just hope so i just hope so hope so once upon a time a president of a great nation was on life support how will the economy how will it oh shit. may the lord give you understanding don't think too much about that nation a, a certain nation the president was on life support and, and he was supposed to lead the nation he was supposed to command the armed forces he, oh that's too much for a man that's why your life can't produce anything you're on life support the the agenda is about keeping you alive it's not about you fulfilling destiny yeah <laughs> Everywhere I go, everywhere, everywhere, from Tanzania to ah, people on life support, to Togo, life support, life support everywhere, Benin Republic, life support, Europe, advanced life support, not just <laughs> the life support is big, it's big. Jesus Christ. In fact, we have nations on life support. Nations. And he speak a parable to this end the men ought always to pray and not to faint. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. There are two terminologies Jesus introduced in his presentation on the subject of prayer that he never used on any other subject. The first is hypocrite. Because it's possible for you in your prayer enterprise to be a hypocrite. So you're making effort but your effort doesn't strike any chord where God is in heaven. It strikes a chord in Cape Town but it doesn't strike a chord in heaven. The brethren in Cape Town have named you a prayer warrior because you're like a locomotive. Any, anytime you are, you are praying, coop, 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 coop. So in Cape Town, unfortunately for you, our father is not who are, is not in Cape Town. That's the problem. That's the problem with the hypocrite. He he is blind to where our father is. But we, we'll, we'll just take it one one at a time. So he introduces a terminology. The first one is hypocrite. And this issue of hypocrite, we have a giving hypocrite, we have a prayer hypocrite, we have a fasting hypocrite. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to. Uh, I want us to be friends. At least this is the first time. Let's be friends now. 
let's be friends now. <laughs> we need, I need to make friends now. Many of my friends left because of the word of God. They left. They left. They said, no, his own is too much. They left. So um, I'm trying to ensure that you don't leave also. <laughs> Preach the sermon and, oh my God. Everywhere. Insults on Facebook. Uh, But you know, that's the call of the apostle. God can send you like Jeremiah to stand on the truth, even if it is not pop popular. The man on life support can do that. Hallelujah. So we'll define the terminology hypocrite first. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets and they may be seen of men verily I say unto you they have their reward the problem about the hypocrite is that his audience is a mortal the one he's trying to impress is a human the one he's trying to impress doesn't have the capacity to furnish answers A hypocrite doesn't retain the knowledge of the location he's hoping to engage. So he wants to be seen of men. Are you there? I need to ask you a question quickly. When you pray, what do you seek? You seek answers? Yeah, you seek answers. And indeed, God will give you answers. But the reason for which God wants you to pray, even though he will give you answers, is not because of answers. The reason for which God wants you to pray is because he wants to give you rewards. Stop wait, wait, hold on. Do you see the, what he said about the hypocrite? He loves to pray in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets to be seen by men Verily I say unto you, he has his reward. God, through prayer, wants to give you a reward. But we are looking for answers. But God wants to give us a reward. A hypocrite can even get answers. It is a reward that is excluded from. For instance, the Bible says, Call unto me and I will answer you because you look for answers. So I'm going to answer you. But in addition to the answer, you're not asking for this, but your prayer was a sufficient reason for me to give you that. And I and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That's the reward. You were not asking for it, but your prayer set you up for that dimension. So you find yourself, if you make prayer a consistent practice, you, one of those days God will usher you into the realm of power. Not because you even ask for power. That comes as a reward. You begin to press, 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 and then God says, He gives you a personal covenant. Say, okay, you'll never lack again. That, that, that's it. You were not asking for sustenance. You were just seeking grace so that you could prosecute His will. He said, oh, okay, okay. Um, you know what? You won't lack again, and your children won't lack again. You won't need to go to a car stand to prize a car because I will provide it before you. The need of it comes. That's a reward. You didn't ask for that. Do you remember when uh, Solomon was talking with God and he was saying, give me wisdom to do this, wisdom to do this. Oh, because you did not ask for the life of your enemies, you did not ask for this. Reward. Some of you are still operating on, on the scale of answers. I, I left that realm long time. But the thing is this, a hypocrite cannot have. A hypocrite is transactional. It's just like some of you here, you are giving because you hope to receive. And indeed, God is faithful. He will keep the contract with you at that level. But someone else, oh yeah, oh yeah, he will keep the contract. But the woman with the alabaster box was not breaking that box on Jesus because she wanted to receive anything. When the analysis of the current um, price of the perfume was done, it was a year's wages. 
minimum wage times 12. What's the minimum wage in South Africa? Minimum wage. Oh, 3,500? Okay, you times it by 12. What, what was that? So, uh, you, you, I think you have an idea of the kind of perfume we are talking about. And this woman comes into the room and she... Those days, perfumes were not in bottles, they were in boxes. That means it is for one-time use. So when you unveil it, it, it will waste. So you wait for a, a very significant moment in your life. And for an average lady, she waits for her wedding day, then she unveils as a sign that, okay, I am going to waste on this, my husband. If I, my bottle is intact, and I'm coming to pour the fragrance of all I am to adorn this man's destiny. So that was a cultural perspective. And that day, there was no wedding. This woman now comes with... I've, I've left the subject of prayer. Let me go back. <laughs> I'm just showing you like that, that, that. Aish. Unveil the box. People stood back to analyze it. The first person that spoke was Judas. <laughs> Judas said, It is a waste. And he did not add Lord. He just said it is a waste. The other disciple says, Lord, it is a waste. Because when you begin to sacrifice for the purpose of God, even unbelievers and believers without understanding will say you are wasting. Meanwhile, when the whole thing was going on, Jesus was quiet. He was trying to understand from the Spirit the significance of this sacrifice. He said, ah! This woman had picked it up in the spirit that I would not be in the tomb for them to come and embalm me. So she came and embalmed me beforehand. It was only the father that knew that there was such a need and he moved the woman. The need was not obvious. She did that. The perfume poured it on. You still remember that the guys and I went with 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 the embalming, the perfumes, when they went there, <laughs> there was no need for that which they brought. Then God then gave her a reward. Not an answer. Because she was not requesting for anything. He said, wherever the gospel is preached, this act that you have done will be remembered as a memory. God can give you your, a covenant, a, your, a personal covenant that will work just in your family and all your children. A personal covenant because there was a place you arrived in your prayer that God was moved. He gives you something. Let me show you one. The number one I said I will show you about our father. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy father which is in secret. Stop there. First insight about our father is that he is in secret. That's why the, the hypocrite will never strike any chord with him because he is in secret. And the reason why that guy ended up being a hypocrite is because he lacks revelation of God as father. If he knew the fatherhood of God, he would have understood that it is domiciled in secret. Huh. Uh -huh. So imagine, my children, they wanted a favor for me. They were in my study room. And they were discussing how they would manipulate me to respond to their request. Unknown to them, I was peeping at them through the keyhole. I was in secret. <laughs> I was in secret. Because they were not aware of the fact that I was in secret. What they were doing did not guarantee their answer. Someone is fighting with his wife at home. He comes to church and when she leads worship, because he's, he's angelic, you will see him. And then the one that sees in secret will. Okay. <laughs> I 
and he is not conscious of the fact that the transaction he had with his wife will affect his ascendancy. He doesn't know because he thinks he's communicating with someone that is in Cape Town. He's in secret. There are things that will happen to you that will make you not mount the pulpit. Because you have traveled long to know that he's in secret. That anything you say from the spirit from the pulpit will be mingled with that error that you have not dealt with in your heart. And it will spread in the congregation. He's in secret. The average believer is not conscious of the secret. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, that is the door of your heart. I'm, I'm going to show you, I'll prove it to you that it's talking about your heart. Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret will reward thee openly. So he is in secret, that's number one. Number two, he sees in secret. It is possible, like I was in my bedroom, I was in secret, but I was seen publicly. Huh? But the thing about our father is that he is in secret, and he has limited himself to see in secret. It is only the reward that he gives. Open. So he wants the world to know that this man has a secret with me. So he gives you a reward that the world can identify with. It's just like conception. Conception takes place in secret and the resultant effect of conception is in the secret. It will be growing. By the time it grows to a point where everybody knows that's a reward. 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 But there are many things that happen in secret that translates to something that is visible. If you don't know the ways of the secret, then you don't have depth. A tree it doesn't cry out when it is taking root. Taking, root taking is quiet, silent, hidden, and secret. So if I'm praying for you, and I pray for you for 20 years, you never know. Because some things are secret things. The average believer is on the stage. He wants to be seen. I'm on television! That's how we are. We don't know the ways of the secret. We don't know anymore. The ways of the secret. Where you are giving 90% of the funds that drives this ministry, and even the pastor does not know. Just look and say, okay. Maybe the pastor just makes an announcement about a project. And he just picks the account number. He doesn't even give in church. He goes home on a work, work day, Wednesday, where people don't expect miracles. And he uses his company account so that he cannot be traced to an individual. The reason why he's doing that is because he knows that his father is the one that has the secret eyes. He's not looking for a, he's not looking for recognition from the pastor because he's not a hypocrite. The hypocrite is the one that we want the pastor to know, you know, we just sent in a check on Wednesday uh, and we are about to uh, send in a, a, a vehicle to be taking you around. You have your reward. So the pastor doesn't know who is behind this company. And he just keeps doing it. Just keeps doing it. Maybe somewhere along the line, because he's an influential man, he interacts with people and then he now discovers that, oh, that company belongs to this man. But that's 20 years after he has kept the secret life. So when you decide to put yourself on the stage for people to see, what you are doing is that you exclude yourself from the world. Now that guy that is doing that secret transaction, he's doing it because he wants the eyes of the one that sees in secret alone to see it. Oh. And the one that sees in secret, he rewards openly. So people don't know why the economic meltdown does not affect the man's company. People don't know why the circumstances that crippled others became the same springboard and launching pad that shut him out. It was because he entered into the economy of a reward and the details of a reward require that it be open, it be public. You cannot put it in your pocket. You know, you've been doing it in secret, but you see, the result of it will not be secret. So in our city, we pray, we pray a little, pray a little. Many ministers of the gospel came to ask me what sin I had committed that I was praying like that. 
Is it because of sin? <laughs> Hallelujah. They called, they called us names and all kinds of stuff. But uh, after 14 years of consistent intercession, the Lord sent his angel to me. We were in a meeting like this. And there was a powerful praise and worship uh, singer, just like my sister. And she began to sing. And then suddenly I realized that I was not in the meeting anymore. I was taken to heaven. And I was standing before Jesus. And Jesus spoke to me. Take my presence and my power to the peoples of the world. That was how my power ministry took root. I came back from the experience, came into the hall. And I was supposed to minister that night. Guess what? I couldn't preach. I just stood on the pulpit. And that was all. I came back to the same city because that was not my city. I came back to my city. Signs and wonders began to take place. They said that my wedding ring was a magic ring. That was why I stopped wearing my wedding ring for how many years? Like 12 years or so. Because they said it was a magic ring. Even when I stop wearing this, I've swallowed the ring. It's more effective in my stomach. So it has been swallowed. <laughs> as much as we wanted to hide, we could not hide the reward. It was loud. The church needs to learn the art of taking root again, quiet roots. You say your son has strayed, he doesn't have that power. If you know the way of your knees, what will hit him? That he will become an evangelist. Huh? He will not be able to describe it all the days of his life. He's not that strong. It, was it not uh, Jonah that said he doesn't want to preach? Then he entered. It, 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 what Jonah was trying to tell God was that I'm using my will against your will. That was the day it became clear that the will of man is nothing. When the sovereignty of God goes to work, even your will cannot stand in his way. You don't will, you, you do not will to do his will, but his sovereignty goes to work. At the end of the day, without your consent, you will still find yourself in the same thing that. So that's what happened to you. God is bigger than your will. That's your small will. He's bigger than you. I've seen a little of those dimensions of God in terms of his sovereignty. Uh, if, you, if you touch that aspect of him, you will worship him for life. For life. You know, most of our advancement towards God is mechanical. You have not traveled. You have not gone deep. You have not gone close to, to gaze on the light. Africa needs to be stronger. We need to find the, the armor of our God. We need to awake from our sleep. Because this is our time. Thank you for watching and if this video has blessed you, please like, kindly subscribe and also tap on the notification bell so you can stay notified and updated on our new videos. And please do not forget to share the link to people so we can bless more people. And most importantly, we want to know how this video has blessed you under the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe.